many of you in this room, you've probably been puzzling with the results of the Head Start Impact Study showing that we have nice early effects that last at the end of the Head Start year that, that go away at the end of kindergarten and first and third grade. And so what I want to do is talk some about my experiences in trying to um, analyze this to better understand how experiences across kindergarten and Head Start could come together to promote development. I want to, I want to move a little bit to the side and talk about um, just theoretically, how might we think about kindergarten and Head Start coming together in ways that might promote or inhibit kids' development? So just a little bit of a theoretical exercise to, to try to understand this notion ultimately of, of continuity. I wish Deborah Stipek was here because I think her, is she here? Because her, her talk, I think, um, was a nice introduction to what I'm going to do where we talk about continuity, but we don't really have much empirical evidence to suggest First of all, to define what it is or to suggest how it matters for kids' long-term development. So the last thing I'll do is present some interesting preliminary results as a, I mean, these, these results are fresh off the printer from three days ago, and it was, it's in a, a first attempt to try to find some empirical evidence around how continuity and consistency of experiences across multiple settings come together in ways that promote kids' development. So let me just talk a little bit about the Head Start Impact Study. I realize who I'm talking to, and I don't have to go into too much detail here. But as you all know, the Head Start, it was uh, first implemented in the summer of 1965 as an eight-week-long summer program. Um, it was created to provide comprehensive services to uh, support mental, social, emotional development of young children from economically disadvantaged backgrounds. So in the reauthorization of, of Head Start, Congress said that, well, what we need to do in 1998 is to do a study to determine on a national level the impacts that this program is making on the children and the family families that it serves. An advisory committee a year later came up with a plan for a framework for how we should go about studying the impacts of this program. And in 2002, the Head Start Impact Study began. The design of the study that the advisory group commissioned was a randomized controlled trial, internally valid, let's look at the impacts of random assignment to this program on kids' um, long-term outcomes. So we have a group that received a, an offering of access to the program and a group that did not in the control group. It was a nationally representative sample of 84 grantee, or grantee um, agencies, those receiving the federal funds. And it involved two co cohorts of entering children, three-year-olds at fall of 2002, and a cohort of four-year-olds who were randomly assigned into the, into the program. The study was longitudinal, so children and parent outcomes assessed at the <clears throat> end of the Head Start year, at the end of the kindergarten, first grade, and third grade year. And finally, multiple outcomes. And you can get lost among the different outcomes that they assessed, both in terms of cognitive, language, math, social, emotional, um, as well as parenting outcomes. And you know, I don't need to say much more about this, but if you look at the left box over here, if you look at the, the four-year-old cohort, what you find at the end of the Head Start year in those gray boxes are statistically significant differences in favor of those kids who were offered access to the program at the end of the uh, Head Start year. You look beyond, uh, beyond to the right and you don't see those gray boxes anymore, which suggests that there's no statistically significant difference anymore at, the, at these later points. For the three-year-olds, you find also some positive effects on cognitive outcomes at the end of the three-year-old Head Start year. Some of them on some of these academic outcomes like emergent literacy and, and uh, the CTOP or uh, phonological processing, they persisted at the end of the next year. But basically what you see by and large, these, these effects um, diminished. I like to point out that this is the intent to treat estimates of, of this um, study, which is the impacts of offering access to the program. What you need to keep in mind is that a quarter of the kids who were offered access, 23% of the kids who were offered access to Head Start did not accept it, did not attend Head Start. What's also important to keep in mind is that the control group, um, I think it's, well, I've got the numbers somewhere around here, I think it's maybe 11% of those kids, maybe 14%, actually did attend Head Start, did attend a Head Start program. Um, and you know, if you look at those kids in the control group, about 40% of them had stayed at home. Um, and so keep in mind, as we talked yesterday, the impacts that you find are relative to the comparisons that you're making. So let's just move on now to the social outcomes. Um, you know, no, no real differences on these outcomes. Most of them were parent reports of kids' social emotional outcomes. For the three-year-olds, you do find significant reductions in hyperactive behavior and problem behaviors. So here's what we can conclude. When you offer children access to Head Start, it has positive impacts on their cognitive skills at the end of the Head Start year. 
and that these early advantages basically, um, you know, fade out, we don't want to say that, we'll drop off by the end of the, the kindergarten year. You know, does this come as a surprise? Uh, not so much. I mean, empirically, when you look at Greg's work, those impacts across multiple studies and a meta-analysis really show the same thing, that, that the effects drop off down the road. But do we also believe that an intervention that lasts nine months when kids are four is going to launch them on this trajectory that's going to continue into the future on things that we're measuring? Those are some of the questions that, 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 we, that we can answer around this launch hypothesis as opposed to hypotheses are, that relate to sustaining those inputs, the booster, giving kids ongoing and continued um, inputs to maintain the, these outcomes. So I'm just going to spend a little bit of time with this. So uh, as a part of the Head Start Impact study, I worked with a, a with the, the folks at Westat and a colleague at the University of Virginia to try to answer the question from an experimental perspective of what is the role of kids' kindergarten experiences, kindergarten experiences on those impacts that we're finding at the end of kindergarten. And so what we set out to do is to address that question. Are the impacts of Head Start, again, random assignment, are the impacts of offering access to Head Start on children's cognitive and social emotional outcomes at the in, end of kindergarten conditioned upon, moderated by, do they, are they dependent upon the types of experiences kids had when they were in kindergarten? This is going to go really fast, by the way. So we, um, we've, we selected a handful of cognitive and social emotional. We didn't do all 40 or whatever number of outcomes. We looked at just cognitive in terms of PPVT, so receptive vocabulary, letter naming, and applied problem solving, both from the Woodcock Johnson. And then we have parent reports of social skills and positive approaches to learning and problem behaviors. We looked at the kindergarten experiences data, and what you're left with in that study is teachers' reports of these things. There were no observations, which as somebody who thinks about proximal processes as being the drivers of development, that's kind of what you need to know to better understand what promotes kids' long-term outcomes or what moderates the impacts of, of Head Start. And so what we had, though, was how much academic instruction kids were exposed to, um, the school-wide proficiency on the state tests that came from the Common Core, um, whether it was a full-day kindergarten and class size. And we did some primary analyses where basically we built from the intent to treat analyses of kindergarten outcomes, the same ones that were reported earlier. And we then added kindergarten experiences as a moderator of those impacts. We also did a number of um, you know, pre uh, preliminary analyses. We made sure that, that kindergarten experiences were exogenous to the treatment to, to study condition. We looked at the nesting of kids within kindergarten classrooms. Interestingly, these kids just disperse everywhere. It's less than one and a half kids from the Head Start Impact study in, kinder, in the same kindergarten classrooms. These kids are going all over the place. And so what did we find? Well, confusing, inconsistent, and hard to interpret. I told you this was going to be short. And, and so uh, there, there's some problems with what we, what we did, as you guys might suspect. One is this notion of distal measures of kids' experiences in kindergarten. We were asking teachers things like, you know, how much math do you do? Is, is that we were thinking about is how, how might we expect that to moderate the impacts? Would we expect that more math to be better for kids who went through Head Start, more math to be worse for kids who were offered access to Head Start? So I think the major challenge we had was just shaky hypotheses. We try, what we went into this with in terms of hypotheses was quality by risk associations. And so what we thought was, okay, if you didn't go to Head Start, you were at risk. You, you developmentally, at the end of the Head Start year, you hadn't achieved as many cognitive, as high a cognitive outcome. So we'll say that's a proxy for developmental risk. We'll say these measures of kindergarten experiences are proxies for quality. And then we can start making hypotheses that, hey, maybe quality has a stronger positive effect on those kids who come from developmental risk. That's a hypothesis, but it comes back to a lot of assumptions we had about those data, both in terms of quality, which I don't think we're measuring quality, and risk, which I'm not sure we're measuring risk. So. Conclusions, it's not clear if and how children's subsequent experiences in kindergarten affected the impacts of Head Start based upon those analyses. By the way, this ended up as a memo that, that wasn't published given the complexity and the sort of, you know, hard to interpret results that we, that we had. But what it led to now is this new question, how might children's experiences in kindergarten impact the long-term development of, these of those children who attended Head Start? Now all of a sudden we're in this mode, we're using science in an iterative way. We've learned something now. Let's now start making hypotheses. Let's start let's, hypotheses. Let's start thinking this through. How might we think that kindergarten is going to impact the outcomes that kids had from Head Start? So I just want to quickly go through this. I realize I'm at 15 minutes. 
And what I want to do is just do a bit of a thought exercise in terms of how we might describe this movement of kids from Head Start to kindergarten, and then what sort of developmental processes would explain the ways in which Head Start and kindergarten come together to promote positive outcomes for kids. So let's just think about an individual child and just describing this course of development over these two years. So my daughter um, drew that one right before she entered kindergarten. And this is a child who, over time, is going to have a transition into a new school, which unfortunately that is kids running out of the school, which I didn't realize that <laughs> and, uh, until pretty recently. So that's not a point I'm trying to make here. But it's going to continue to have kids run out of the school during this presentation. And then what we have is kids entering kindergarten, and then we hope that they're ready, no matter, you know, in some way that we define and measure, maybe measure uh, kindergarten readiness. And then we want to see how this child develops by the end of kindergarten. So this is really just sort of from the child's perspective. We've got the child, we've got time, we've got this transition, and then we've got these outcomes, these long-term outcomes. As a community psychologist and as someone who, who's only theoretical um, perspective comes from Bronfenbrenner, I think a lot, this is all basically Bronfenbrenner. We basically have these primary developmental settings. The family and the classrooms are the primary ones. I'm going to focus mostly on the classrooms. I do believe that family interactions are probably the main driver of kids' development over time. But for the purposes of this talk, I just want to point out that what we have is developmental settings that are the primary places wherein kids develop. It's the home, it's the classroom, and these are settings where the child lives, actively participates, has defined activities, relationships, and roles. And then you can layer these systems on top of it. Head Start administration, K-12 administration. I don't want to go too far into this. You can also start locating yourself within this framework as a researcher. I'm not a bubble, but I, I probably could draw myself a bubble that hopefully overlaps with administration so that my research can inform policy, hopefully overlaps with Head Start classrooms so my research can informed practice, but really this just sort of lays out a landscape, and that's really what I want to just point out right now. So next thing, let's start explaining kids' development over the course of this two-year period. And so I've put little processes or mechanisms on top of this, these ch the, the kids' heads to point out that there's a lot of developmental theories that put the child as their own agent in their own development, right? This is not about let us just teaching the child. This is about children creating their own knowledge and they're creating their own view of the world. And so we've got a bunch of wonderful theories that put development in the hands of the individual child who's trying to make sense of the world around them. When they receive new information that doesn't fit within a category, they've got to accommodate this new information and that's how learning and development occur. We've got basic developmental needs that kids have around autonomy and competence, feelings of mastery, relatedness, needing relationships. When kids have those needs fulfilled, then they're going to go off on a course of positive development because they're going to be motivated. We've got language theories that, that say that kids have innate abilities to come into this world and hear all this noise around them and somehow make sense of it so that we can have, they, can make, they, they can identify nouns and they can identify verbs. And next thing you know, you're having conversations and communication. So I just want to you know, basically say that we've got child-level theories about how kids are developing over time. We've got setting or ecological um, theories, and so you can see these little processes in these primary developmental settings, in the classroom and in the home. And I want to talk a little bit about the, the classroom more specifically. So what we know, and this is, this is straight up Bronfenbrenner, maybe with a little Vygotsky mix, mixed in. So a child's development occurs. Now think about this. This is really critical. How kids learn and develop comes through back and forth interactions that the child has with other people, objects, or symbols that occur on a regular basis, that occur over extended periods of time, and that become progressively more complex, that push the child to new levels, a, a bit like scaffolding. So we have a pretty good sense of what kids need, what, what fuels development within each of these primary developmental settings. And if I even go further and talk about what, um, what are the key ingredients in these primary developmental settings, it's these action verbs. It's when you see kids doing these kinds of things, creating, discovering, supporting, expanding, writing. These action verbs are the indicators of kids learning within their primary developmental settings. So I just want to say we know quite a bit about what works for kids, what kids need within their classrooms. And, and this comes from um, you know, basically the, the class or a framework for understanding how we might measure kids' development. And basically what we would say is that um, 
classrooms and homes that promote development are emo pro support kids' emotions, emotional needs, are well organized, and provide instruction and inputs that are attuned to the child's developmental abilities. Okay, I just want to go back to this for one second and say that there is now a dynamic perspective about kids' development that we need to think about. And all of us, so all of a sudden, this two dimensional space around kids' learning and development doesn't really accurately portray what is happening. Development is a movie, it happens in real time. And what happens is you've got now this, this process, this mechanism between Head Start classrooms and kindergarten classrooms that is another input to kids' development. So let, let me get a little more, um, more specific. So from the beginning of Head Start to the end of kindergarten, it's not just the child that's changing. It's their classrooms that are changing, and it's the, set, it's the systems that support those classrooms that are changing. One thing we know from developmental theorists, and this, came, this is what continuity is, um, and this is what we've talked about up to now, is that the, a child's development is affected by the degree of stability, consistency, and predictability in their experiences across settings. Okay, developmental inputs now across settings is what we want to think about. And this now can lead us to new sorts of research questions. Well, these kids are now moving into kindergarten classrooms. What happens when they get into these kindergarten classrooms? As my friend Daphna from the University of Virginia, Daphna Basak says, well, kindergarten is now the new first grade. These kids are now moving into classroom experiences where there's a lot more academic instruction, where there's a lot more whole group instruction, and it's less frequent choice of kids getting to choose, spend time choosing what they want to do. So, so a research question that should drive us is, how do these instructional practices in Head Start and kindergarten classrooms impact children's development of these academic and social outcomes? So we actually have some hypotheses now based upon this idea that systems are dynamic and stability and consistency are important inputs to kids' long-term development. So we, ha we can have a consistency hypothesis about social emotional development. Think about if you're a child and you went to a Head Start classroom where play was most of the day, where most of the day was spent in child choice. What happens to that child when they are put into a kindergarten classroom where that they have much less choice? All of a sudden, their world is different. All of a sudden, they're going to have trouble adjusting to and adapting to socially that context, hy hypothetically. Similarly, what if they come from a classroom, Head Start classroom, that didn't have much choice for kids? All of a sudden, they move to a kindergarten classroom, a consistency with a lot of choice, a consistency hypothesis would make you say that might not be the best pattern for kids if we believe that things need to be predictable and consistent across these two grades. Similarly, academic development. What happens if you have a child who came into a um, kindergarten classroom that was heavily academically directed? If, if that child came from a Head Start classroom that had relatively low amount of academic focus, how is that child going to adjust to and adapt to that setting? How is their academic development going to proceed when they come into a place where the academic inputs are different than what they experienced before? So this is, this is some of the hypotheses that we're, that we're putting out there now around continuity. So I'm going to end now with some new analyses that, um, that my graduate student Rita and I have been working on, which tries to answer the question about what happens after Head Start and how do experiences in kindergarten the instructional experiences kids have affect kids' development after Head Start. So the research questions, and this is going to come from the Head Start Impact Study, for kids who attended Head Start, to what extent do the instructional practices that they experience in kindergarten impact their academic and social development during kindergarten? But then more to our hypotheses. To what extent do, the, do these experiences in kindergarten affect kids' development? Does it depend upon the types of experiences kids had when they were in Head Start. So the sample, children from the Head Start Impact Study, 1,039 of them, it's the four-year-old cohort looking at the four-year-olds progressing into kindergarten. We picked any child who had attended Head Start, whether from the treatment group or the control group, and we wanted them to have complete data on these instructional practices measure across both grades. Demographics, it, it reflects the Head Start um, Impact Study uh, sample. Half female, you know, 31% African American, 37% Hispanic, 31% white. Um, I'm not going to read the rest. All right, so measures. How are we measuring instructional practices in Head Start and kindergarten? 
There are questions reported by both the Head Start teacher and the kindergarten teacher on how often do you or someone else do each of the following activities. Things like um, discussing new words, practicing the sounds that letters make, working on learning the names of letters. And then for the math activities, things like counting out loud, working with shape blocks, counting things such as small toys to learn math. Teachers in kindergarten and in Head Start also answered the question of how much time do the children in your classroom spend daily in the following activities, where the child chooses and activities where the adult directs the whole class. If you look at the descriptive statistics down here, one of the difficulties we have with this measure is the, the skewedness. Um, so if you look at frequency of literacy and math activities in both Head Start and in kindergarten, the averages are over five. They're between five and six. Keep in mind that the increments of time are a little wacky here, where a six, the most frequent would be every day, and you can imagine many teachers reporting that. Um, a five would be three to four times per week, so we're really thinking days in terms of the amount of instructional time. For the activity types, um, it's, it's, it's more incremental in terms of time per day. And so what you get um, is, you know, one would be no time, two is 30 to 30 minutes or less. So on average in Head Start, the average is a 3.4, so somewhere between one and two hours spent in Head Start classrooms. Um, in kindergarten, about one hour on average. In, in terms of whole group activities, um, about 30 minutes, between 30 minutes to an hour in Head Start, and then a 3.11 over one hour in kindergarten. So what you can see is, you know, based upon this, an increase in the frequency of literacy and language activities, about the same in terms of math across the Head Start to kindergarten transition, um, a decrease in child choice, and an increase in whole group activities. Some correlations here, I, I just really want to point out the ones down here that basically show when, when you look at um, the, the reports of kindergarten teachers and correlate them at the child level with the reports of their Head Start teachers, you basically have a zero, a zero correlation as one, one might expect. The outcomes we chose, we just kept the five um, from the analysis that I reported earlier, and then we added one, which I'm not sure why we didn't include before, but it was a teacher report of kids' aggression while in um, classrooms. And so these are the descriptive statistics here. Analyses, um, we ran linear regressions. I, wish, I should say these are preliminary. I mean, we, we really are digging deep in, into, into these, and this is really the, the first step into it. So we had end of kindergarten as our outcome. We had end of Head Start as our pretest, and so we're looking at development during the kindergarten year. We entered instructional practices in kindergarten and instructional practices in Head Start um, to see the extent to which each of those instructional practices affects kids' development during kindergarten. And then we, then we um, tested specific interactions. So for kids' math development, we looked to see whether the, ex the amount of, ex of instruction kids had in math in kindergarten affected their development and whether that, that effect was um, conditioned upon or made stronger or weaker based upon those earlier experiences. So basically our, our test of continuity is one of a moderator between where we have a kindergarten experience effect on kindergarten development and answering a question of whether that association is moderated by the, the nature of experiences kids had prior. So a couple of things to point out here. If you look at just the instructional practices in kindergarten, what you see is those instructional practices overall had no significant positive main effect on kids' development during kindergarten. Whether they had a lot of math, a lot of language, a little bit, whole group, a lot, a little bit, there is no statistically significant positive association. However, those effects do depend on, at least on math, math outcomes, on what kids experience during the Head Start year. And so let me put this up here right now. So what you have along the bottom here is the frequency of math activities that kids had in kindergarten. And for that dotted line, the one that's going up, what you find is for kids who came from a Head Start classroom with relatively high amounts of math instruction, that those kids are going to benefit more from more math instruction in kindergarten. The exact opposite happens with the, the low group. More math instruction in kindergarten has a negative association for those kids who came in with less math, ex math instruction in their, in their tool bag, in their experiences. So I, you know, what we're doing is testing slopes and seeing whether the slopes of these lines are different, and yes, they are. But what's even more compelling is just let's look at the, the means here, where we've got on this group up here about a 98, let's say, 97 and a half for, for kids who, who cycle into kindergarten classrooms with a lot of math instruction those kids who came from a Head Start classroom with a lot of math instruction are at a 97 and a half. All other things being equal, except 
another group of kids coming in with low math instruction, those kids are three, three and a half, four points lower on a standardized assessment, which in our case has a standard deviation of 12 here. So we're talking about a third of a standard deviation difference in math achievement based so simply upon what experiences kids had um, prior. Keep in mind, we're testing slopes here, and so I'm kind of just cherry picking means here to show this, but I want to illustrate that these are not trivial differences and something that hadn't really, I hadn't ever seen before, at least in the work that I've, I've conducted. I looked at this separately for boys and girls, and most of this effect is actually driven by girls, which kind of surprised me. I was expecting that boys might need consistency more, but again, the slope of these lines are steeper for girls or, and then from the, the prior figure we looked at. And then you start looking at these means across the right and look at a 101 compared to a 95 or 96, we're talking almost a half a standard deviation difference. If you're a kid who went, into, if you're a girl who went into a kindergarten classroom that had a lot of academic instruction, the difference between you and somebody who, who came from a high Head Start instruction classroom was about a half a standard deviation higher than those kids who came from a classroom in Head Start that had less instruction. Now for these social emotional outcomes, two out of the three that we looked at showed up as being significant. These are marginally significant, but what you can find again is that the slopes of the line differ depending upon whether you came from a Head Start classroom that had less or more child choice, where again it looks like consistency of experiences seems to be um, relate to more positive outcomes. I think this is probably a better example of that consistency of experiences with kids social emotional development, classroom aggression, when kids um, are in, in a classroom, a kindergarten classroom that has a lot of whole group activities, when they come from a uh, Head Start classroom that has a whole lot of, of whole group activities, they're going to have lower aggression in kindergarten classrooms. So I just I want to point out that we're looking at slopes here, and we need to look at both ends of this continuum. And it's not always more is better for those who had more, less is better for those who had less, I think is important to think about. So just some conclusions. This is some initial evidence that it looks like the effects of kindergarten instructional practices on children's development during kindergarten, dependent upon what they carried in with them, from Head Start, that it looks like this consistency in instructional practices across the Head Start to kindergarten classroom is positively associated with the rate that kids develop math and social skills after they leave Head Start. So next steps and implications, I'm going to point out these limitations. It's quasi-experimental. We're making some assumptions that all things are being equal when we're comparing slopes and we're comparing means. There's low variation in these instructional practices, which is another limitation. Um, just so, some next steps, what, you know, in the Head Start Impact Study, we have first grade experiences reported by teachers and we have first grade outcomes. So you can continue this notion of continuity across this three year period. What I'd love to do is think about this for the three year olds in the Head Start Impact Study and their movement to four year old classrooms, mainly because those data actually have observations of kids' experiences within those, each of those classrooms as being things that we could sort of tie together over time. Imagine if we could test hypotheses about what if you go from a harsh three-year-old classroom into a sensitive and warm kindergarten classroom or vice versa. And so we can start asking these questions not about instructional practices, but about classroom processes. So implications, I don't, I, I don't want to say that I'm opening up any new box by saying there's implications of continuity. Everybody knows this. You talk to interventionists, everybody is on top of this. Everybody recognizes that we need strategies to promote the long-term effects of our investment, early investments. There's follow-through programs of Head Start that have been tested that, that um, look to see how can you provide more services um, to kids after they leave Head Start to promote these outcomes. This notion of alignment, connecting systems, so that the instruction, so that the assessments, so that the curriculum, so that the classroom practices are all aligned with each other from Head Start to kindergarten, people, people are doing that work. So I just want to, I, I really just leave this behind as some, uh, some empirical evidence about this continuity thing and this consistency thing that shows that it seems to be working well for kids, which in terms of their long-term development, in terms of sustaining the impacts of kid, uh, at the end of kindergarten for those kids who, who went through Head Start. So um, there's tons of people who are doing the intervention work to address this problem. Um, I think this just gives some illustration with data that the problem does really show itself up when kids move from one set of experiences that's not in, in, to a kindergarten classroom that's not consistent with those experiences that they had the prior year. Thank you.